Welcome to Eco201 Economics. This is lecture 10 on the costs of production. Now, before we begin talking about these costs of production, I just want to explain a few things about how this next unit is going to work. The next unit that we'll be presenting isn't based like the lectures we've had so far in one of these single principles of economics that we're introducing and explaining, or one of these basic ideas that most economists can agree upon, like the last lecture on externalities. Now, we're going to have a five lecture unit that explains where supply decisions come from, how businesses make decisions, and what the importance of different market structures is to the outcomes that we would expect that market to generate. So as a whole, these five lectures will explain part of what we mean when we say that markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity and what is required for that to be true. And first, we have to present why it is that businesses make the decisions that they make by presenting certain sorts of measures of what their costs are. So we presented in that lecture on uh, welfare economics, we presented this willingness to accept or willingness to sell or cost as being the fundamental determinant of whether or not a particular business would choose to put a particular unit on the market, comparing that price to their own cost. But we didn't explain anything about where that cost came from. And in the very simple example that we used, we said that one individual might provide that service or not provide that service based on one single measure of cost so that one individual might have a cost of 10. Now, obviously, that isn't very much like a real business making decision. Now, a real business decision might include costs that vary according to the quantity that that business produces. And that business won't choose to produce one or not produce one. That business will need to choose whether to produce 10,000 or 20,000 or 12,000 or 2 million units of that particular good. Now, in that particular scenario, the framework in which we would describe cost is substantially more complicated. So for those kinds of businesses with those kinds of more realistic decisions, the way in which we would define supply, which comes from cost, is likewise more complex. So we need to first describe where these costs for a more realistic sort of business come from, and then what the different types of cost are, and how those types of costs ultimately influence the decisions that businesses will make, which costs are important in which scenario. Now we assume that in all of these cases, for this five lecture unit on business decision making and market structure, we assume that the goal of a business is simple and it's to maximize the profits for that business. A business universally wants more profit rather than less profit. And provided the managers of that business are rational, business decision making should be guided by profit maximization the goal of making as much profit as possible. And calculation of profit is simple. Profit is the total revenue that the business receives minus the total cost that they pay for all of the inputs and things like that in their production process. Total revenue we can calculate also in a very simple way. It's the price that they charge for all of the goods that they produce times the quantity of those goods that they produce cost might be a little bit more complex. Now, for business decision making, we can also characterize the costs that those businesses face in two big categories. The first being explicit costs. This is a definition that we use. It's more economic jargon. And the second being implicit costs. So what's the difference between those? An explicit cost is something that the business actually has to pay money for. So most of the costs you would naturally think of being associated with a business, those are explicit costs. Wages that they have to pay for their workers, those are explicit costs. Rent for buildings that they occupy, that's an explicit cost. The cost for milk, the cost for coffee beans, things like that that Starbucks must purchase in order to sell you a latte, those are explicit costs, as are, say, taxes.
But businesses can also have costs that economists would consider to be relevant for which they don't actually need to spend any money. So no money goes out of the business, but rather usually money does not come into the business. Those are implicit costs. Whereas explicit costs are money a business needs to spend, implicit costs are money that a business can't receive. So an implicit cost might, for example, be if a business owns a building which it uses, the implicit rent that the business loses by not renting that building out to someone else. Or if you work for a business that you own and don't pay yourself a wage, you could have been working for some other company. And if you worked for some other company, you would be paid a wage. But working for yourself, you're not paid a wage. So by working for yourself, for your own business, you sacrifice that wage. It's an opportunity cost. You've lost the opportunity to earn a wage. It's an implicit rather than explicit cost. Now, we would imagine that for business decision making, businesses ought to consider all opportunity costs, whether they are explicit or implicit. They should consider them equally. So whether a business owns a building which it occupies or does not own that building and rather rents it, the cost of that space, be it an explicit rent or an implicit rent, should be treated identically as far as their decision making is concerned. Now this explicit cost plus implicit cost would be a total cost for the business. And we would consider that businesses should consider that total economic cost. Now, often when you see something about a business's profitability on the news, if you're watching some kind of financial programs, what you'll hear about as a definition of profit is what we call accounting profit, which takes into account only accounting costs or explicit costs. That is the money that the business is actually spending, but not the money that the business is not receiving. So to the extent that businesses own a lot of capital, own a lot of property, own buildings and things like that. Businesses accounting profits can often be quite high, even though their economic profit, using this total economic cost definition, may be low. But we would say that the proper definition of profit for business decision making is this economic profit rather than this accounting profit that factors in implicit costs. The proper definition of cost for business decision making is a total cost that factors in both explicit and implicit costs. Next, what we want to describe is where these costs come from for a business. A person or a business doesn't simply have a cost of 10, as we've mentioned. We'd say is a business has something we describe as a production function. A production function is a relationship that we could express as an algebraic function between the output that that business produces, say they're producing automobiles or they're producing electricity or they're producing potatoes. The output that they produce is a function of all of the inputs that they require in order to produce that output. So the output of electricity is a function of the amount of coal that they use the amount of power plant capital and machinery that they use, the amount of labor that they have available. Potato output is a function of the farmland which is used, the fertilizer which is used, the farm labor which is used, the farm machinery capital which is used, etc. You see, assume that businesses have a production function and however that production function might be approximated, businesses know it pretty well. All those, out, those of us outside of the business wouldn't have any incentive to know it as well as they do. So in our simple example, suppose that we have a farmer. That farmer is named Jack. That farmer is growing wheat. And he has a fixed amount of land. So his amount of land is five acres. So that land is one input in his production function. Now, the other inputs in his production function will be labor. And we imagine Farmer Jack could hire one worker or two workers or three workers or four workers, or as many workers as he wants. 
but he has a fixed amount of land on which to grow wheat in our production function example. Now, for this simple example, we'll ignore the fact that he might also need seeds, he might also need fertilizer, he might also need water. In a more realistic production function, those should factor in as well. But for simplicity's sake, we'll just use land and labor as the two necessary inputs. On our simple example, suppose that if Farmer Jack has no workers employed, including himself, so our labor quantity in the production function is zero, the quantity of wheat that he produces is zero. And then if he hires one worker, which could be himself, again, even if he doesn't pay himself a wage, there's an implicit cost to his business of hiring himself because he could work for someone else instead and be paid a wage. And if he did that, if he has just one worker for a labor quantity of one in his production function, we see that his quantity of wheat output is 1,000. Well, if he hires a second worker, so his labor quantity in his production function is 2, then his quantity of wheat output rises from 1,000 to 1,800. If he hires a third worker, then his quantity of wheat output in his production function rises to 2,400. The fourth worker increases wheat output further to 2,800. And the fifth worker increases wheat output further to 3,000. And if we plot all of those points on a two-dimensional graph in production quantity and labor space, we can see that the quantity of output is increasing, but it's increasing at a decreasing rate. This will be a common feature for our production functions, all sorts of production functions. While one production input is increased, while other production inputs are held constant. In this case, labor is increased while the amount of land is held constant. So we add more workers, but we don't add more land for them to work on. Well, the next concept we want to introduce is something called a marginal product. We said way back when, what we mean by marginal in the context of the economics, marginal refers to a small change from an initial point. In this case, the additional product, the initial value which is added by the next worker. So it's the marginal product of the third worker rather than the average product or average productivity of the first three workers together. So our marginal product of the third worker looks at how much additional output we're able to produce when we add the third worker. That's the marginal product of the third worker. And this is just the change in output divided by the change in the number of workers here. The change in the number of workers is one. So if we take that schedule from the previous slide, we can convert it to marginal product to see what the marginal product of the first worker is and the second worker and the third worker and the fourth worker and the fifth worker. And what we'll see is that that marginal product is diminishing as we increase the number of workers. That marginal product is diminishing from 1,000 for the first worker to 800 for the second worker. That's 1,800 minus 1,000 to 600 for the third worker, 400 for the fourth worker, and 200 for the fifth worker. Now, we haven't shown what would happen if we add a sixth worker, but given the rate at which marginal product is diminishing, the sixth worker might not add anything at all because the sixth worker might be entirely unnecessary. That marginal product, in this case, the marginal product of labor, what we write in shorthand is MPL. This is also the slope of our production function as we draw our production function in quantity labor space. You can see the slope of our production function is diminishing. The slope is becoming a lower, 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 lower as we increase the number of workers, as we increase the amount of output, because the marginal product of each of those workers is falling. Now, no, this doesn't mean that the fifth worker isn't as good as the fourth worker. What it means is that the fifth worker doesn't have as much to do, or the things that we need to have done that we couldn't have done by only four workers that we would ask the fifth worker to do aren't as important or aren't as valuable 
as the things that the first four workers were doing. This is the reason that our marginal product diminishes as we add more workers without adding more land. Because we're not adding more important tasks for those workers to do. Why would marginal product of labor be so important? Again, this five lecture unit will be about business decision making. How businesses make decisions and therefore how businesses make decisions in different market structures, giving us different outcomes in different market structures. We imagine that business owners or managers like this farmer Jack, they think at the margin. So they make their decisions at the margin and they don't make a decision to hire five workers or none. They hire one worker, then carefully consider whether to hire the second worker, making a hiring decision at the margin. So when they make a decision to hire a worker or not to hire a worker, they'll carefully consider what that worker would add to their business, not based on how good that worker is, but how necessary that worker is. And how necessary that worker is, is described by the marginal product of that worker. Which again, doesn't depend on the worker themselves. It depends on the conditions in which they will work. Now, anytime Farmer Jack is going to hire a worker, he's going to have to pay something. Workers demand wages. And we would assume that all of these workers, if all of these workers are basically the same, even though the tasks they might be asked to do are different, these workers would, be ha would have to be paid in a competitive labor market the same wage. And Farmer Jack would have to pay the same wage for his farm workers as every other farmer would have to pay their farm workers in a competitive labor market. So if he has to pay a certain amount per worker, he would carefully consider whether that worker added enough value to his business to justify the wage. If the value of the output that that worker produced was high enough, then Farmer Jack would hire that worker. If the value that that worker would add to his business wasn't, then he would decide not to. So next, let's put some monetary values in this example with Farmer Jack. And suppose that Farmer Jack has a fixed cost for land. So it could be 200 per acre, but we assume he has five acres that he uses. So his total cost for land is 1,000. And no matter how many workers he hires, that land cost doesn't change. No matter how much wheat he's able to sell, his land cost doesn't change. And that's a part of his total costs of production. Now, the other part of his total cost of production comes from the wages that he has to pay. We assume that the wage that he has to pay a farm worker is determined by some big competitive labor market of which he has very little impact. He has very little control. He's a price taker as one of many, many, many demanders of labor. So the wage that he has to pay is 2000 and he has to pay that wage to each and every worker that he might hire. Now, Farmer Jack has to make the decision about whether to hire one worker or two workers or three workers or four workers or five workers based on an assumption of a 2000 cost. So now what would his cost be to produce 3000 units of wheat? Now, if Farmer Jack decides to hire no workers, so his quantity is zero, he's producing no wheat at all. His quantity of labor is zero, so his wage bill is also zero, but he still has to pay 1000 for the land that he's going to use. So his total cost is 1000. If he decides to hire one worker, his total cost would rise by 2000 to 3000 but his quantity of output would rise to 1,000. So his total cost to produce that 1,000 units of wheat would be 3,000. Next, if you were to hire a second worker, his total cost would rise from 3,000 to 5,000 because that second worker requires an additional 2,000 wage. But now his quantity of wheat he produces rises to 1,800. If he hires a third worker, his cost rises from 5,000 to 7,000. And his quantity of wheat produced rises from 1,800 to 2,400. So we would say that his cost to produce 2,400 tons of wheat would then be 
7,000. And so on, as he hires a fourth worker, as he hires a fifth worker. His quantity of output rises, his cost rises with it. And we say that this cost, this total cost, is the cost that goes along with that amount of wheat output. It's the cost to produce that amount of wheat. If he wants to produce that amount of wheat, this is the cost he must pay to do so. Now, if we take these variables, the quantity of wheat that he's able to produce, and the total cost involved in producing that amount of wheat, and put that in two-dimensional space, as opposed to graphing the quantity uh, of output of wheat and the amount of labor used. Now, the quantity of wheat produced and the cost which must be paid in monetary terms. We plot these values and we get what we call a total cost curve. We show how total cost varies with the amount of output that this business produces. And what we can see is that for Farmer Jack, and this will be common for many types of business, we see that total cost not only increases as he increases his output, but total cost increases exponentially as he increases his output. That is to say, the slope of this curve is rising. It's becoming more steep as he increases the quantity of output. Now that defines total cost for the business and how we would calculate total cost for the business to produce a particular quantity. The total cost for all the labor which is necessary to produce that quantity, all the land which is necessary to produce that quantity, all of the capital or any other inputs that are necessary to produce that quantity. Next, we want to define another concept, a more relevant uh, cost for business decision making called marginal cost. Now, marginal cost is a cost at the margin, the margin being the next. Here, this is the cost to produce the next unit of output. Our marginal cost would be calculated uh, in our context here, mathematically in a more simple way, as a change in total cost divided by a change in quantity. So here we're looking at the marginal cost of the first thousand units or the marginal cost of the next 800 units. Now, if we have an explicit production function, so we have an explicit algebraic cost function, we would calculate a marginal cost as a derivative. Then it would be a point estimate of a cost. But here we haven't uh, specified an actual algebraic function, so we won't go that far. I'm going to carry this over to that cost schedule that you just saw and try to calculate what those marginal costs are for the first units and the next units and the next units on Farmer Jack's cost schedule. As Farmer Jack hires the first worker and increases his quantity of output from 0 to 1,000, his change in quantity will be 1,000. Now, his change in cost as he produces 1,000 instead of 0, not his total cost, but his change in cost will be 2,000 because this requires him to hire exactly one worker and one worker costs 2,000. So the marginal cost of those first 1,000 units would be 2,000 change in cost divided by 1,000 change in quantity. Now, as he hires the second worker, he'll also have an additional increase in cost of 2,000, but now he has a smaller change in quantity. Now the change in quantity is only 800. So for those units, those units of output that are produced by the second worker, we divide a change of cost of 2,000 by a change in quantity of 800. And we get a marginal cost for those 800 units of 2.5. Now, for the next worker, the cost again will be 2,000. In a competitive labor market, we'll assume that all workers need to be paid the same wage, no matter how productive they are in his particular business. The amount of uh, increase in quantity will be only 600, but the cost will be the same, it will be 2,000. So now our marginal cost of those 600 units will be 2,000 divided by 600, or 3.33 marginal cost per unit. As we increase our quantity of, of labor hired further to four, our additional quantity is now only 400. It's the additional value, that marginal product of the fourth worker. 
but the cost is the same. It's still 2,000. So the marginal cost of those units is now 2,000 divided by 400, or 5. We can see here the marginal cost has risen from 2 to 2.5 to 3.3 to 5, further to 10 as we hire the fifth worker and have an additional marginal product of labor of only 200 for that fifth worker, but still a cost of 2,000. Now, just as we did with total cost, we can take this marginal cost schedule, this table that we've created, and we can plot this in two-dimensional space with cost or money on one axis and the quantity of output that's produced on the other. And if we plot these combinations of quantity and marginal cost, this will generate what we call a marginal cost curve, or the relationship between marginal cost and the quantity of output. As we see here, marginal cost is upward sloping, it means marginal cost rises, typically, the more quantity we produce. And marginal cost, in this case, is increasing at an increasing rate. It's increasing exponentially as we increase the quantity of output. Why might this be the case? Well, marginal cost is rising as we increase the quantity of output, specifically because productivity is decreasing as we increase the quantity of labor that we hire, which is necessary for us to increase the quantity that we produce. So ultimately, the reason that we expect uh, for businesses costs to increase as they increase the amount that they produce, marginal costs to increase as they increase the quantity that they produce, is that cost is fundamentally determined by productivity. We're talking about the cost to produce a good. And if productivity of labor or productivity of capital, productivity of other inputs decreases, the more output we try to produce, actually the cost to produce that output will rise as well. well we mentioned just a few minutes ago that marginal cost as compared to total cost is a particularly important type of cost for businesses to consider in their decision making. Why is that the case? Marginal cost is particularly important because one of the key decisions that businesses need to make is called an output decision. How much output they should choose to produce. And many of the other decisions that you think of businesses making, decisions about how to hire, decisions about how much land to use, all of these kinds of decisions are indirectly determined by that output decision. How big the business wants to be, how much output they want to produce. So, Do they want to produce 2 million units of output or 1 million units of output or 1,000 units of output? They need to carefully consider whether the cost to produce the 2 millionth unit of output is low enough that it's profitable. By comparing the price, and the marginal cost to produce that two millionth unit of output. Farmer Jack, in this case, needs to carefully consider how much wheat he wants to produce, which determines how many workers he wants to hire. Does he want to produce 3,000? He's not going to want to produce 3,000 units of wheat, which has a marginal cost of 10, unless the price per unit of wheat is at least 10. He has to carefully consider those marginal costs of those units of wheat between 2,800 and 3,000. If that price of wheat is, say, 6 or 8 between 10 and 5, then the units of wheat between 2,800 and 3,000 would not be worthwhile for Farmer Jack to produce, but those units of wheat up to 2,800 would. And indirectly, he would decide to hire four workers by making the decision to produce 2,800 tons of wheat. Marginal cost is particularly important because we assume that Farmer Jack, like any business owner, wants to maximize profit. He can only maximize profit by producing units where the price is greater than the cost to produce, the marginal cost to produce that particular unit. Now, if he produces goods which have a marginal cost of 10 and sells them for a price of 7, his profit would fall as a result of producing those units. So it would not be rational for him to produce those units. Therefore, it would not be rational for him to hire the worker which was needed to produce those units.
next, I want to describe a few more definitions of cost and types of cost that will be important for other business decisions other than simply the output decision, what the efficient amount of output to produce is. We need the marginal cost and only the marginal cost in order to determine that. Now, business costs can be characterized as either fixed on the one hand or variable on the other. And by definition, all costs must be either fixed or variable. Because if a cost is variable, it means simply that it is not fixed. And if it's fixed, it means simply that it is not variable. So total cost is just the sum of fixed and variable costs. A fixed cost is one that a business can't avoid no matter what they do and no matter how much output they decide to produce. So fixed costs don't vary with a quantity of output. That fixed cost would remain the same. In this simple example with Farmer Jack, we assume that Farmer Jack has a fixed amount of land which he cannot change. Perhaps he has a contractual obligation to continue to use that land and pay a rent on that land for years. And that cost of that land to him of 1000 is therefore a fixed cost. If he decides to hire no workers, therefore produce no wheat and have no revenues, his fixed cost is still 1000 He can't change it. If he decides to hire five workers, therefore produce 3,000 tons of wheat, his cost for land of 1000 does not increase. It remains exactly 1000 And this is the case for all costs that we would classify as fixed. In Farmer Jack's case, labor costs are variable. They're variable because he can change them. And they're variable because they do change as he makes decisions in order to produce more output. If he wants to produce 3,000 units of output rather than 1,000 units of output, he needs to hire more workers, increasing his variable costs of production. Now to describe these fixed costs and variable costs and how they'll change as we increase the amount of production, and how they might inform certain types of business decision making, we'll move away from the Farmer Jack specific example toward a more general example, or won't present a specific firm with a specific industry and a specific type of inputs. Just imagine that if this general business produces no output, this general uh, business will still have some fixed cost. Here the fixed cost is 100, just by assumption. But the variable cost, if the business decides to produce no output, will be zero. It will always be zero. We assume if a cost is variable, it's possible for a business to avoid these costs by choosing to produce nothing, choosing to hire no workers, etc. If it wasn't possible for a business to avoid those costs by hiring no workers, producing no output, then those would be fixed costs rather than variable costs. Oh no, we imagine this business can produce one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instead of zero. And if it does so, its fixed cost does not change. Its fixed cost remains 100, 100 to 100 to 100 to 100 down this cost schedule. But the variable cost as this business decides to produce more output will rise as the business makes the indirect decisions, such as hiring more workers, using more electricity, renting larger buildings, whatever it is that they have to vary in order to produce more output. Their variable cost increases from zero with no output to 700 with one unit of output, up to 120 with two units of output, and up and up and up and up until they ultimately reach 520 with seven units of output. If we simply sum those fixed costs and variable costs, adding 100 to each of those variable costs, we get total cost. Because again, total cost must be equal to fixed plus variable cost because all costs are either fixed or variable. And then we can plot those curves in the same space in a two-dimensional graph with cost on the, horizon, on the vertical axis with cost on the vertical axis and with a quantity on the horizontal axis. Of course, our fixed cost, since our fixed cost does not vary with quantity, 
our fixed cost is just a horizontal line. Fixed cost would always be a horizontal line. There and our variable cost and our total cost continue to rise as we produce more output. And our total cost is always above our variable cost because our total cost includes 100 in fixed cost. It's shifted up by 100. Now next, given this information for this hypothetical abstract firm about quantities of output they could potentially produce and how much it would cost them to produce, we can calculate a change in cost as they move from zero output to one and as they move from one output to two and as they move from two output to three, which will be our marginal cost. As they move from one output to two, their total cost rises from 170 to 220, giving a marginal cost of 50. Now for the first unit that they produced, moving from zero to one, moving from zero to one, they had an increase in cost from 100 to 170. So they had a marginal cost of 70 for the first unit. You see, in this particular case, the marginal cost of the second unit is actually lower than the marginal cost for the first. And for the third unit, their marginal cost, as we go from 220 total cost to 260 total cost, is only 40. So their marginal cost falls further. But for every unit of output that they produce past three, adding the fourth unit, the four fifth unit, the sixth unit, the seventh unit, marginal cost is now increasing. Moving from three to four, we increase total cost from 260 to 310, as seen on the schedule before, which leads to a marginal cost of 50. Now, whereas total cost is always likely to be increasing as we produce more output, it's not necessarily always the case with a real production function or realistic approximation of a firm that marginal cost would always be increasing due to diminishing marginal productivity of labor and other inputs as we increase the quantity that we produce. For small quantities of output, it could actually be the case that marginal cost falls as we increase the quantity of output. Marginal cost could fall because for a very small number of workers, for example, it might be difficult for them to specialize in certain tasks in the business. If we imagine, say, a restaurant as our simple example of a business, imagine how a restaurant might operate with only one worker. If we have only one worker, that one worker in the restaurant would need to simultaneously keep the restaurant clean and serve food to the table and actually prepare the food in the kitchen. If that worker can't specialize in just one of those tasks, that worker may not be very productive. But if we add a second worker or a third worker, so we have one worker in the kitchen, one worker bringing food to tables, one worker keeping the place clean, each of those workers would be specialized and productive, and the marginal cost of producing food might be lower than it would be if we had only one worker in that restaurant. An example of the case we see here, where initially when the business is very small, the quantity of output is very small, marginal cost is falling, but past a certain point, it begins to rise and rise and rise and rise, just as we saw in the Farmer Jack example. The next costs, definitions of costs that we'd like to introduce, are average costs. To compare average costs to marginal cost. Now an average cost is just the total cost divided by some quantity that's produced. We have a total cost of producing 3,000 units divided by 3,000. The total cost to produce five units divided by five. That's the average cost. Now here, our average fixed cost for producing one unit would be the total fixed cost of 100 divided by one, 100. But as we increase output from one to two, our fixed cost stays the same and our average fixed cost would therefore fall from 100, 100 divided by 1, to 50, 100 divided by 2. And our average fixed cost would start high and continue to decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease the larger our amount of output became. As we can see, we have a diminishing, but not exponentially diminishing, 
diminishing average fixed cost as we increase quantity of output. Next, we want to look at average variable cost. Your average variable cost would be the total variable cost involved in producing a particular quantity of output divided by the quantity that we produce. If we produce one unit, we have a variable cost in our simple abstract example of 70, so our average variable cost is 70. As we go from a quantity of output of 1 to a quantity of output of 2, our total variable cost would go from 70 to 120. That means a marginal cost of 50. But our average variable cost is simply 120 divided by 2 for an average variable cost of 60. Just like marginal cost is lower for the second unit, here average variable cost is also lower for the second unit. For our third unit, our total variable cost increased from 120 to 160. Our marginal cost was now 40. But in this case, our average variable cost is simply 160 divided by 3. 53.3333333333. Now it's also fallen, just like marginal cost has fallen. Marginal cost fell from 50 to 40. Here our average variable cost has also fallen from uh, 60 to 53.3333. Next, for the fourth unit, our average variable cost uh, is 210, our total variable cost, divided by 4, our quantity of output, or 52.5, has fallen still further. But after the fourth unit, after the fourth unit, our average variable cost begins to rise and rise and rise as the marginal cost of producing the fifth unit and the sixth unit and the seventh unit also rises. You see, whereas marginal cost often has this sort of U shape of initially decreasing due to increasing productivity due to specialization in a very small business, average variable cost will have a similar shape will also decrease initially while marginal cost decreases before ultimately rising. As a business reaches a certain threshold in size, there are no longer any productivity gains through specialization in the business and productivity begins to decline as we push more workers into a fixed amount of land or fixed amount of capital. Now, the last measure of cost that we'll introduce is called average total cost. Average total cost, like average variable cost, is simply total cost divided by the quantity. It's an average. Average total cost is also equal to average variable cost plus average fixed cost, because all costs are either fixed or variable. Now, average fixed cost in our scenario starts with a quantity of one, and a total cost of 170 at 170. And as we move from a quantity of 1 to a quantity of 2, therefore a total cost of 220, the average total cost falls from 170 to 110. Our average total cost here continues to fall for the third unit, for the fourth unit, and even for the fifth unit. Our average total cost here is minimized for a quantity of output of 5 before ultimately again rising due to increasing marginal costs, due to diminishing productivity. Once we have as many workers as we need in this business, there are no more productivity gains to be had through specialization and we're simply cramming more workers into the same space. Say, filling our kitchen in our restaurant with unnecessary workers. And average total cost begins to rise to 80 the 88.57, etc. Now note, here we have a marginal cost which initially falls before rising and an average variable cost which initially falls before rising and an average total cost which initially falls before rising. So you might naturally assume that there's a connection between the latter and the first two. And of course, if we have a marginal cost which initially falls before rising and an average variable cost that falls before rising, then even if we don't even have fixed costs, we'll have an average total cost which falls before rising. 
because it would simply be average variable cost. But now, even if marginal cost was constant, therefore average variable cost didn't start uh, by falling before rising, we would still have an average total cost which could fall before rising. And this is because average total cost incorporates average fixed cost. And even in such a scenario, average fixed cost is always falling the more output we produce because we're simply spreading a certain fixed cost over a larger quantity of output. Now, because of this, the first units of output will see fixed cost dominating in total cost and average fixed cost dominating in average total cost. But as we produce relatively more and more and more and more output, more of our costs become variable relative to fixed, and the impact of variable cost begin to dominate. So if average variable cost is increasing, but average total cost is decreasing, for the first units of output, average total cost will also be decreasing because average fixed cost dominates. And average uh, total cost would begin increasing for larger amounts of output because for larger amounts of output, average variable cost would dominate. You'll note, as we can't easily graph total costs along with marginal costs because the scale is so different. We can easily graph on the same uh, quantity and cost space or quantity and money space with cost on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. We can easily graph average variable, average total, average fixed cost together with marginal cost. And what you see in the graph on the slide is a typical illustration of what these curves look like when they're put in the same space. And where they intersect will turn out to be particularly important. But we'll get to this in a few minutes. Next, we'll go through one worked example to give you an idea of what kind of calculations and preparations you might need to do for questions on a midterm exam. Bear in mind that different definitions of cost that we've discussed, fixed cost, variable cost, average total cost, marginal cost, they're all interrelated. If we know one, we can use that to help calculate the values for the others. So we have a table of average variable cost, average total cost, marginal cost, with some blanks, some pieces missing. But we can use the information here that we do have to calculate values for those cells in this table that we don't. Now first, when we look at this table, we're missing a value here for variable cost at zero. We know the variable cost, if we're not producing any output at all, here our quantity of output goes from 0 to 1 to 2 all the way up to 6. If we're not producing any output at all, we shouldn't have to pay any variable costs. All of those costs, if our output is 0, they should be fixed. So our variable cost should always be 0 with a quantity of 0. So we can plug in right here. Variable cost at quantity 0 should be 0. And then any costs that we have left, they should all be fixed. So if our total cost is estimated to be 50, when our quantity of output is 0, we must have a fixed cost of 50. If our fixed cost is 50, then our total cost must be variable cost plus 50. So in the second cell here, we know the variable cost is 10. And now we've determined that our fixed cost is 50, and it doesn't change as we increase our output. So our total cost will be 60. And for this cell right here, we say our variable cost is 150. We know our fixed cost is 50, so our total cost must be 200. Next, if we know that our cost is 50, our fixed cost is 50. We should be able to calculate all of those values for average fixed cost by dividing that 50 by our quantity of output. And here we see an average fixed cost of 16.67 with a quantity of 3 consistent with that, etc. So for a quantity of 1 and a total fixed cost of 50, we can plug in an average fixed cost, also 50. 
Our average fixed cost with a quantity of 2 would be 50 divided by 2, should be 25. Next, with a quantity of 5, our average fixed cost should be 50 divided by 5, it should be 10. Now, if we know our average fixed cost, and we know our average variable cost, we can add those two together to get our average total cost. So right here, for a quantity of 5, we have an average fixed cost of 10, an average variable cost of 30, so we should have an average total cost of 10 plus 30, or 40. Plug that value in right here. And for this point here, with a quantity of 4, now we have an average fixed cost of 12.5, and we have an average total cost of 37.5, and that 37.5 must be equal to 12.5, plus our average variable cost. So our average variable cost must be 37.5 minus 12.5, or 25. That last value here, that average variable cost that we have here with two units of output, that we can calculate because we know what the variable cost is. We know the variable cost is 30, Average variable cost must be 30 divided by 2. So average variable cost would be 15. And here with a quantity of output of 2, we know our average total, our average total cost is just total cost divided by our quantity of 2. Total cost is 80, so average total cost should be 80 divided by 2, or 40. Next. How can we calculate this variable cost and total cost for a quantity of 3? Well, now we know what our average variable cost is. It's 20. And our variable cost must just be our average variable cost times the quantity that we produce. If the average is 20 and we produce 3 units, our variable cost must be 60. Here also, our total cost is 36.67 for that quantity of output of 3. So our total cost, now for producing 3 units of output, that must be 36.67 times 3, 110. Now the last blanks that we haven't filled in, those will be our marginal costs. A marginal cost to produce the first unit, marginal cost to produce the second unit, marginal cost to produce the third unit. But since we know the total cost to produce all of those units of output, we can use those to calculate our total card. Since we know the total cost to produce all those units of output, we can use those to calculate the marginal cost of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth units of output produce the second unit of output requires us to increase our total cost from 60 to 80. So that marginal cost would be 20, just 80 minus 60, since the change in quantity is 1. We can fill in that blank with a 20. Now how about the marginal cost here for our fourth unit? If we produce 4 units instead of 3, it causes our total cost to increase from 110 to 150. 150 minus 110 is 40. Our marginal cost is 40. Now the last blank on our table, one more thing to calculate, that marginal cost for the fifth unit. Producing the fifth unit causes us to increase the quantity that we... Uh, distracted. Producing that fifth unit causes us to increase our total cost from 150 to 200. So producing that fifth unit increases our cost by 50. 200 minus 150. Our marginal cost of the fifth unit is 50. We can see that in this simple worked example, our marginal cost continues to increase as we produce more and more and more and more output. But 
our average total cost does not continually increase as we produce more and more and more and out more output. It starts high because we have an initially high average fixed cost. It begins to fall before reaching a minimum. And then after that, it rises as the rising average variable cost dominates. But note, because marginal cost is continually increasing as we produce more quantity, so is average variable cost. So we've established that average total cost typically is U-shaped. It's U-shaped because it initially slopes downward, reaches a minimum, and then begins to slope upward. For one portion of that curve, average fixed cost dominates. Average fixed cost slopes down. For the other portion of that curve, average variable cost dominates. And average variable cost likely slopes up. And there's that one minimum point. And the minimum point has a special name. We call it the efficient scale. That is, it's the scale of production for that business at which their average total cost of production is as low as it could possibly be. Now, why do we introduce all of these terms, introduce all of these concepts? They're all particularly important for things we'll discuss later to do with market structure and the behavior of the firm. Certain decisions are critically dependent on average total cost. Certain decisions are critically dependent on average variable cost. Certain decisions are critically dependent on marginal cost. And certain outcomes that we can say about markets, whether they are or are not desirable, are related to the efficient scale. At that efficient scale, that minimum of average total cost, one key relationship between these cost curves can be defined. That for the, all of those points where average total cost is sloping down, marginal cost, whether it's sloping up or not, will be below average total cost. That marginal cost, that's the cost to produce the next unit. If the cost to produce the next unit is less than the cost on average to produce all of the previous units, then logically the average cost of producing more units will be less, and average total cost will be sloping down. But past that minimum point, We'll say marginal cost is always above the average total cost curve, past that minimum quantity, that cost minimizing quantity for average total cost, the efficient scale. When marginal cost is above the average total cost curve, that means the cost to produce the next unit is high relative to the average cost of producing all of the other units. And if the marginal cost is high, it will be pulling up the average total cost as we produce more. So this relationship will always hold. Those two curves, marginal cost and average total cost, will always intersect specifically at that point where average total cost is minimized at the efficient scale. And this will turn out to be quite important when we talk about market structure and market outcomes in the next chapter. So next, we're not quite finished with drawing distinctions between different types, different categories of cost. We talked already about variable versus fixed cost. We talked already about marginal versus average cost or total versus average cost and costs which are explicit versus implicit. Now we want to talk about costs which are short run and costs which are long run. Short run and long run are a bit ambiguous in terms of what exact time frame we refer to in economics. A short run could be one month, it could be one day, it could be one year. A long run could be 10 years. Here, the difference between the two, we actually define based on whether costs are fixed or are not. If our time frame is defined in such a way that some costs continue to be fixed, we consider this the short run. So there are some things that a business continues to have to pay for that they can't possibly vary. So whether our time frame is short run or long run could be determined by things like length of contract or the time it takes to move to a new building or the time it takes to be able to buy a plane if the business in question is something like an airline. Now, we won't say anything specific about exactly how long it takes because for different businesses it would take a different amount of time to go from short run to long run.
But by definition, we would say short run includes both variable costs and fixed costs that we can't change. But in the long run, there's no such thing as a fixed cost. Everything that was once fixed in the short run, if we move to the long run, we assume we have enough time that those costs have become variable because those inputs have become variable. It's now possible for us to move to a new building. It's now possible for us to get a new plane. It's now possible for us to get out from those contractual relationships that we entered into. It could take many years or it could take only a few days, depending on the business in question. What we want to look at is a distinction between a long run average total cost, in which all costs are variable, versus short run average total cost in which certain inputs are fixed. So now, imagine in this simple example that the thing that might be fixed in the short run is the factory. We have purchased a factory, installed all of our machinery in a factory, entered into some contractual relationships as a result of our decision to use that factory. And it isn't easy for us to change the factory that we use or the size of the factory that we used once we've done that. Now, we could have a small factory in the short run or a medium factory in the short run or a large factory in the short run. In the long run, we can choose whichever size factory we want, depending on what's best for us. But in the short run, we have to continue using the factory that we have. And the short run, where we have to continue using the factory that we have, will have different average total cost curves depending on which factory size we chose. So we'll have one short run average total cost curve for a small factory. We'll have another short run average total cost curve for a medium sized factory. And we'll have another short, uh, short run average total cost curve for a large factory. Now we suppose that if we chose initially that, sh uh, that small factory, then it's very expensive for us to try to produce a very large amount of output continuing to use that small factory. And if we'd initially chose a large factory, it likewise becomes very expensive for us as a high average total cost for us to produce a small quantity of output. Now, if we plot these three together, we see that those three short run average total cost curves, they have different minima. That is, there are different efficient scales of production depending on how big our factory is. And producing more or less than that efficient scale of production means a higher average total cost, a higher short run average total cost than it could otherwise be. Also to note, for certain ranges of output here, it's better for us, actually has a lower short run average total cost if our factory size is small. That's for the smallest levels of output. For medium levels of output, it's now more efficient, cheaper, has a lower cost, lower average total cost for us to produce, not using a small factory, but using a medium sized factory. And for a higher range of output, it's more efficient for us in having a, a lower short run average total cost if we were to use a large factory. Now, if we assume that we go from the short run to the long run, in the long run we can choose whatever size factory we want. We're not stuck with a small factory just because we decided to use a small factory in the short run. If we would prefer a large factory, we can switch to a large factory in the long run. So in the long run, our average total cost curve would be the total cost curve, average total cost curve, that uses the most efficient possible factory size, the cost minimizing factory size. So in the long run, if we prefer a small quantity of output, our long run average total cost curve would assume that our factory is small. We would use that portion of the short run average total cost curve for a small factory. But if we were going to use a medium quantity of output in the long run, we wouldn't use the average total cost curve that goes along with a small factory. We would use the average total cost curve that goes along with a medium sized factory. And the same for a large factory, for a large quantity of output. So here in the long run, our long run average total cost curve is the minimum 
of all of our potential short-run average total cost curves, or in mathematical terminology, we could refer to this as the envelope of all of those potential short-run average total cost curves we could have had that go along with different factory sizes. Of course, in the long run, we wouldn't just have three potential factory sizes, just small, medium, large. We could have infinitely many variations in between, slightly larger, slightly larger, slightly larger. So our long run average total cost curve would be a smooth curve, smooth U shape, which connects many, 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 many minima of different short run average total cost curves. Now, as we've drawn it here, this long run average total cost curve isn't exactly U-shaped, or it isn't exactly U-shaped in the same way that those short run average total cost curves were U-shaped. Uh, this that we've drawn has an initial area at which that long run average total cost curve is sloping down. But then there's another range in the middle where the long run average total cost curve is flat. And then once output becomes suitably high, long run average total cost begins to slope up again. Now this is because the reasons that a long run average total cost curve might slope up or down are different than the reasons that a short run average total cost curve might slope up or down. Here in the case of a short run average total cost curve, we said that it might slope down or might slope up just depending on the productivity of workers and how many workers were cramming into a fixed space. The big reason that it ought to slope up as we add more and more and more workers is that there isn't as much for them to do in a fixed space. There isn't as much machinery for them to use, isn't as much land for them to use, etc. Now, the case to be made is different here for long run average total cost because now we assume we can vary the amount of land, we can vary the amount of space, etc. So it should be possible for us, instead of cramming more workers into a new factory, to actually open another factory that was exactly the same as the previous factory. Now, if we can just open another factory and another factory and another factory and another factory, we wouldn't necessarily expect our average total cost of production to change at all as we scaled up our production. And that's what we expect to happen right there in the middle range where long run average total cost is constant, it's flat. Now, for that initial level, that initial level where we have decreasing average total cost, our story would be different. That this is an organizational improvement in productivity as a result of increasing our scale. We'd call this economies of scale. That as our business becomes larger, something in the way we're able to organize production, not just in how we shove workers into a factory, but something about how we're able to organize production at a larger scale is more efficient. This could be how our various inputs combine together, or it could be because we're, say, spreading research and development expenditures over a larger number of units of output, or administrative overhead, we're spreading over a larger number of units of output. We expect that for many businesses, there's a certain level at which we would have increasing productivity overall for all of our outputs together, all of our inputs together, of increasing returns to scale or economies of scale. But that we would hit a certain level of output at which we would exhaust all of those opportunities uh, for economies of scale or increasing returns to scale. And then we would have constant returns to scale. And constant returns to scale. We're not decreasing the administrative overhead burden or anything like that. We're simply opening more identical factories or we're opening more identical restaurants or something like that. And then we would imagine that for most businesses they might eventually, as they became extremely large, hit some quantity of production at which the administrative burden of organizing such an enormous business might become so high that administrative inefficiencies would kick in and the average total cost, long run average total cost of production would begin to rise. Also might imagine that business could become so large that they could begin driving up the price of some kinds of scarce inputs. And if that happened, that could also cause, as they became very large, average costs of production to rise. Now, 
For many businesses that you might think of, you might intuitively think of economies of scale as being the dominant feature of production for those kinds of businesses. You might think, well, logically, as this business gets bigger, I've always heard that their cost of production falls. And that's because for some businesses, they have economies of scale going out to a very large quantity of production. A quantity of production that's so large, they may not actually be able to find buyers for such a huge quantity. As one example, it might be the case that for cell phone service, that cell phone service providers have economies of scale out to an extremely large quantity of output that they could potentially have in Turkey, say, 800 million subscribers before they exhausted all of these possible opportunities for economies of scale or increasing returns to scale. But there aren't 800 million potential subscribers. So they can't possibly exhaust all of those before they exhaust demand. Now, for those businesses, those businesses, those kinds of businesses would see these increasing returns to scale or economies of scale as a dominant feature of the industry. And we'll get into in a future lecture to the implications that that has for market structure. For many other businesses, if they are very small, particularly when this business or this industry is young, they would see an initial phase in which they became rapidly more productive as they grew. And their economies of scale would kick in as they grew, but they will eventually hit a point where that business and that industry is matured and they now have constant or even decreasing returns to scale.